This is Alarm Will, our video series in which we get to know a composer on our terms. I'm Gavin Chuck, the manager of Alarm Will Sound, and we're here today with Dave Douglas, jazz musician, composer, and with Maz Brown, Alarm Will Sound's bassist and also a jazz musician. Um, for an episode we're calling today, Alarm Will Barbecue. But you, um, speaking of yes. different styles <laughs> uh, and different influences, classical, jazz, folk music. I'm teaching a new training course at Manus yeah? that's based on uh, Bach chorales and Thelonious Monk tunes. Nice. And so it borders on atonal ear training. Actually, tell us a little bit about how, how you put those two things together. Well, I think that they're both, both things are like distilled models of the form. Mm -hmm. You know, a Bach chorale is just like these raw materials of this thing that's crystallized and just beautiful, lives under its own set of rules. You can take any part of it and learn it to your benefit as a musician. And or, in order to understand it, you have to get into the nuts and bolts. And from a ear training perspective, it can be quite challenging, some of, some of those things. And so I look at a Thelonious Monk tune sort of in the same light. It's a distilled piece with a very defined structure. Mm -hmm. The melody is strong. There's an inner voice. There's a bass movement. The harmony functions in an interesting way. And there are ear training challenges that make it um, well, part of what makes it great music mm -hmm. is that there are these bumps in the road. Um, and I would say the same about the Bach chorale. So I feel like teaching them together and I have classical students and jazz students mm -hmm. and they have to be able to sing both things and play both things. Excellent. So to have somebody have to sing a monk tune and know the inner voice sure. and the melody and the bass part is like an ear training exercise on the level of having to sing an alto voice in a Bach, in a right. chromatic Bach chorale. Sure, and actually uh, from, from Thelonious Monk listening and analyzing that I've done, um, what he plays in the piano is often not the same that's what's notated on a lead sheet, and it only takes that diving into right. it a little bit deeper to, uh, to, to, to hear that, actually. And I mean, it's, I mean, obviously box music is all notated, but to get that experience of the chorale is the same thing. You have to do it to experience it the right way, especially those inner voices, to feel like the magic of how un unbelievable that stuff actually is. Yeah, I would just say two things. It's really interesting because now there are good texts of Monk. Mm -hmm. You know, finally now, after all these years, somebody sure. did good transcriptions and managed to publish them responsibly. Mm -hmm. And so you go to those texts and you actually hear the actual voicing of the music. Yeah. And then it's also been uncovered that a lot of the Bach chorales, he might have only given the bass part and a student might have filled in the inner voices. Mm -hmm. Or some of them were more fluid. Yeah. at the time that they were made. And then you know if you listen to the cantatas, he uses them in endlessly varied ways. So it's, it's not like the chorales are just the end result of his creative search. It's just like, okay, here's this crystallized way, and now I'm going to use it in all these other ways, which is a lot like improvised music, I think. Sure. I don't know. I find that fascinating. It Well you're, make, well, you're making connections here between like Thelonious Monk and Bach, and you're the kind of music maker who's making all kinds of connections too, right? We've talked about, um, and I know that you started one of the early projects was with Balkan folk music, and um, so that seems to drive you, and um, curiosity seems to drive um, your music making. Tell us a little bit about the kinds of connections you've made. And oh boy. Well, it, it I, you know, I guess that I stumbled into it innocently enough just by being curious about people and music and hearing something and going, oh my God, what is that? Let me try to figure that out. And then learning that it's part of a whole other tradition that I don't know anything about and I have to go a whole lot deeper and have respect and, you know, listen and study. And uh, I didn't realize that within a specific genre of music, you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed to stay within the strictly defined limits of what that genre is. My father was an amateur musician, um, but 
there was all kinds of music around the house and no one ever said this is the good kind and this is the bad mm -hmm. kind. It just was quality. So I, I just would say, Gavin, um, that it's, it's led to a lot of, uh, I don't know, soul searching for me in terms, in terms of my relationship to jazz because that's the music that I have studied the deepest and that was my earliest love. And I still consider myself a jazz musician because the way my music works is about dialogue in the moment and about um, creating resources for further research. Could you actually, um, actually, I was, one of the questions I was thinking about asking you about was the music that you're making for us. And could you, and that sounds like exactly That's what, what you're I'm asking to do. you guys to do. Right. Well, yeah, not what I'm asking you to do, what I'm making you do. <laughs> It's an invitation to dialogue, mm -hmm. right? And so I had to sort of think up this new system for how it would work with alarm will sound, um, which I I love. You know, that's my wheelhouse. Is th I think that as a jazz composer, your job is to envision a new way that a dialogue between musicians could work. You know, and just create a platform with its own strength and power and identity, but also that invites someone with vocabulary to interact and, and, and do something. Yeah, I love that metaphor of a conversation and with vocabulary because I think one thing that um, I know it's, a, it's important to alarm the sound and I would guess it's important to you, that labeling things is only useful so far, calling it jazz or classical or Balkan or whatever it is. That can be useful just to sort of say a little bit about it, but really what's interesting is saying, oh, you speak music with this vocabulary or with this accent, and let's get in a conversation where we don't lose that vocabulary, don't lose that accent, but we're actually still communicating. And Alarm Will Sound, the collaborations that I've seen, and I know I only know a fraction of what is going on, but you know, Medeski Martin Wood, and I saw the piece with King Brit, and I think what's great is that it is, you know, it, it's in a respectful way encountering a new language and trying to find a way to interact with it from both directions, from the composer's side, arranger's side, and the musician's that's why, that's side. That's why I love the, the <clears throat> idea of conversation. So we're here today in St. Louis, um, enjoying St. Louis barbecue. Um, and that has its own flavor and its own, that's a place to be, right? Um, that also reminds me of something that you've done, which is to celebrate your 50th birthday. You went from place to place. You, um, you Happy birthday. It's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your goal was to tour all 50 states and be in different places. And tell us about that experience and well, what, had, what happened. I had done a series in New York when I turned 40 playing with all my bands and so when I turned 50 I was thinking I don't want this to just be a New York thing how could I make this more of an experience with music, with the people I play with with all the different groups and different configurations and so I was like well what's 50 50 states I'm gonna play in all 50 states I just sort of got up one day and announced it it's sort of the way I you know, I get an idea and I'm like, okay, now I have to figure out how to make this happen. And uh, along the way, my um, manager quit and my booking agent quit. And he <laughs> <laughs> was really... Probably because of that, right? He said, you yeah, were kidding me. It, yeah, it was kind of like, that's a really stupid <laughs> idea, you know. Um, and in a way, that was sort of liberating because I felt like, no, I really believe in this. I believe that, and one of the things that was strong for me is I, I feel like I'm a patriotic American. And I feel that this music is American music. Jazz most of all. Regardle well, jazz, but regardless, you know, just Dave Douglas music. I'm from New Jersey, you know, Snooky, Bruce Springsteen, John Stewart, Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Woody Shaw Count from Basie. Newark. Count Basie. I just feel like I want to be a part of all that and I want to go present that to my countrymen. And so the upshot was that it led me to go visit a lot of parts of the country I'd never been to and appreciate how great it is and also realize that there is a thirst for creative original music everywhere, despite what people will tell you. 
you know, everywhere we went, people were just like thrilled. I can't believe you're here playing in Oklahoma. This is so great, you know. But you, I started to write differently based on all the experiences. We started to play differently. We learned all the new music as we went along. By the end of the experience, we were playing the entire book from memory, three albums worth, plus all the new things. And, um, and we were also playing the hymns that my mother had chosen for her memorial service that were very personal for me and very difficult to arrange because that felt like distant folk music to me. So that, all of that came together on this 50-year tour, and we never made it to all 50 states. So How many did you get? I think we got about 43. That's pretty so, good. 43. You know, yeah, but all you states out there where I didn't come, <laughs> there's still some. Well, you could, for your 70th, you could do the remaining seven. I was thinking like, I, I, I was thinking, I think it was like 61, and there's 11 provinces of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to add those on. And then there's probably how many states in Mexico. So just keep it to North America. And then you expand out, and by the time I'm 190, I'll be going to every country in the world. <laughs> it's good. a small world after all. That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, but you know, what I love about that too is that um, you were sharing music, your music with uh, people all across the country, but obviously, you were taking and you were, they were sharing things with you that influenced Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And I, I, and I feel like this thing that we're talking about with dialogue, you know, in my performances with my band, I feel like whoever is there in the room is just, as, maybe not just as much a part, but a very, very important part of the dialogue. You mentioned the quintet that you toured with on this uh, 50th, um, 43 state tour. And you, you're, you're, you're famous for being in a lot of bands. Have you, have you ever counted how many bands you're in? Like what the number is or do you just... And what's it about actually? What is it about being in so many different I, bands? I did at one point. Um, on that 40th birthday, I did in the space of a week, I performed with each one of the bands that I had at that time. And after it was over, I was so exhausted. But I also thought like maybe I don't have to do it this way. You know, I'm now, you said famous, I don't know about that. but. I had a reputation of somebody having, leading a lot of ensembles and writing for a lot of diverse situations. And that's true, and I, it's the way that I work. I tried to say, okay, now I'm only going to have one band. Time to change. All of these bands I closed after I turned 40, Tiny Bell Trio, Charms of the Night Sky, the Parallel Worlds Band, the Sextet, the Quartet, all of these bands ended. Um, and I said, I'll just have one band. Uh, and that lasted for just about three months. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I don't count them because I don't, because I always feel like probably tomorrow there's going to be some new thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? I just keep rolling along. And, I, and I, I make a, I've made a lot of records. I hope they're all of value. You know, each one is an original repertoire with a vision and a direction, and each one I feel very personally um, um, implicated in. And, uh, and I, about 15 years ago, I started my own label after I left RCA, and I just feel like being able to house all of that and, you know, take control and responsibility for all that music it just feels well, like the way it you, should go I gotta ask you is there one album that your fans come to you and say oh. this is one this is my favorite album that you you know recurring uh, over and over that again. happens with a few different ones and um, I love that there is one like bittersweet aspect to it is that a lot of times those fans only you know they they come up to you to say that in order to ask you to make another one of mm -hmm. those kinds of records and I, you know, my career has been about never doing that. Even when it's the same band, I feel like the second record should be something else. So a lot of people come up about um, Charms of the Night Sky, um, The Infinite touched a lot of people. Seems like um, In Our Lifetime, the, the tribute to Booker Little was one that, that um, I think also, you know, Having been on a major label, the first record from that series that was Soul on Soul for Mary Lou Williams, 
um, is that's one that one. seemed to um, that's one of my favorites. people heard. Yeah. But I, I also, you know, I, I've been doing these electronic jazz, pro, you know, improvised with electronics and beats and producers and different things. And so I, I always feel like, well, like Keystone, that first record was nominated for a Grammy and I was really proud because it, it is kind of forward looking and it's not the easiest listen in the world. Um, and then working with Shigeto, the Detroit electronic music producer um, to make High Risk and Dark Territory, which wasn't all that long ago. So, you know, I just, um, I, I, tr I try to keep moving within each direction of music that fascinates me and growing and find a new way to express that every day. Have you ever heard something um, in somebody else's music that you think, I have to steal that, and did you get oh. away with it? <laughs> uh, first of all, every day. <laughs> Second of all, um, I think that maybe my interpretation of the word steal is different than the way you're using it, because I think that uh, in the arts, inspiration comes in all sorts of forms and yet is always transmuted into something that's one's own, that's different. So if I hear someone play something and I go, oh, I'm gonna, gra I'm gonna remember that and grab that. And I, I used to like carry around a notebook and like write things down. And now it's like, if it's really that good, I just remember it. I don't really write it down anymore. And I'll take it, but by the time it comes out in something that I'm doing, it's completely transformed. You would never recognize it. And even the person, I've had this experience too, where I said, oh, this thing that I did, it was inspired by you. And they're like, but that's horrible. Like, they don't even like it, what it was, you know? I think a lot of composers have talked about that, where you hear something and you may not even like it, but it's something, it triggers something. Yeah, that makes you sense. You know what I mean? And guided Stop. by conversation. Totally guided so by you conversation. You've got a podcast, which is literally a conversation, but yeah. um, what's coming through clearly about you and your approach to music making and to life is that it mm. really is all about conversations. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for having a conversation with us over St. Louis Barbecue. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the barbecue and for the conversation. <laughs>